What's up, everybody? Another, it's called Sunday Sessions, but it's not Sunday. I don't think it really matters though, because it's my show, so I can do what I please with it. But welcome to Sunday Sessions, and this is a live Q&A where I answer questions from you about how to grow your business. So I'm excited to be here. I love talking to y'all. I can't wait till COVID clears up so I can start flying around the world and meeting a bunch of you in person. I'm looking forward to that. I just got off the phone with this lovely woman, Jen. Um, she lives in Australia. I can't wait to go to Australia to meet up with Jen and um, just chill out on the beach, you know, margaritas and just, just chill out. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that. Welcome everybody who's joining. Um, speaking of Australia, where, where are you from? I'd like to hear where everybody else is from. Um, this guy wants to know, he's hit me hard with the questions already. He wants to know first thing to do to start. Um, so the first thing you'd want to do is create an Amazon account. So, and you want to make sure you create a professional seller account and not an individual seller account. Um, an individual seller account, they charge you 99 cents per listing. When it sells a professional seller account, you get prime eligibility unlimited listings just a lot more access to the end consumer uh so we got tucson in the house we got united kingdom we got georgia we got florida tons of people from all over the world we got california we got germany miami amazing this is this is see this is the power of social media it's crazy but let's get right to it we're gonna start answering some questions any question is valued there's no dumb questions please do not be discouraged no judgment this is an an njz this is a no judgment zone so no judgment there's no question that's that's not valid if if you think it's valid ask it uh, so the first question I just saw that popped up there was mm -hmm. how to ungate in categories so what I would suggest doing is, A, before you ever purchase a product, you should always create a test listing. So a test listing is very simple. You would go to Amazon Seller Central, add a product, paste the ASIN in there, or paste the UPC and find the ASIN, and then you would create a test product. So you wanna create a test listing to make sure that there's no approvals necessary or no restrictions before you send it to Amazon. Because the last thing you wanna do is purchase 120 of a specific product, and then you go to create the listing and you realize you can't even sell it, and now you're stuck with all this inventory. That's, that's a bad scenario. So to prevent that from happening, I encourage you to create test listings. Now, when you're creating this test listing, if something pops up where you need ungating or you need approval, um, it will usually give you or always give you some steps to follow. So I encourage you always click through the prompts, follow the prompts all the way until you can't follow them anymore. And most of the time it's just requesting an invoice from a distributor. So if you purchase those products or plan on purchasing those products from a, a reputable distributor, and a lot of people say, well, what's reputable? Reputable is anybody who basically you have a conversation with and they sound like they know what they're talking about. I've been doing business in the wholesale distribution side of Amazon for seven years now, and I'm yet to meet a distributor that Amazon didn't consider reputable. So you get that invoice, you submit it, and then most likely you get approved. And if you don't, you could always resort, last resort, last, last, last resort would be using an ungating service like uh, Funnel Guru. All right, in a YouTube video, I mentioned $2 profit minimum. Does that include also a certain ROI? No, so here's the thing. I've, 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 I've talked about this frequently, but I'd love to talk about it again, ROI. ROI is a, it's a poor indication of how your business is performing and, and not very sufficient way to purchase products. Because let's say, right, he's asking, so this gentleman or woman is asking, um, in a previous video, I discussed how $2 minimum profit, gross profit is our minimum purchase requirement to buy products to resell on Amazon. So if we're not making $2 or more in profits, we won't sell that product. And his question or her question was, what is the ROI on that? Now, this is where it gets complicated because if I said a 20% ROI, let's say the product only cost you $2, you know, now you're talking 40 cent profit. So it, it's, it's just not a good indication. Now, 20% return on investment on a $100 product. Now you're talking $20, so that's a little more sufficient. But even on a $4 product, you know, 20% return on investment. Now you're talking 80 cents. So it's not a lot of money. So I prefer, for the first couple of years we operated our business, we used return on investment and then we stopped using it. 
only because it just, it wasn't a good indicator for growth. Uh, what do we do with our Amazon returns? So I got a great video actually right here um, that tells you exactly what we do with our Amazon returns. But I will give you a brief little synopsis of what we do, so. We put them right here in this pile. <laughs> and they just yeah. sit here forever and ever until it's uh, to the ceiling. <laughs> and then we burn them. <laughs> When we get a product returned back to our warehouse, we have a system in place. We're not just storing them in a corner and looking at them at the end of the month. Uh, we literally daily go through our returns and we make decisions right when we're opening the boxes. Um, so if it's close to expiration and it's a food product, it goes to a donation pallet and we donate it to one of the local um, 501Cs in our area and it goes to people in rehab or the less fortunate or the homeless or wherever it goes, right? Whatever we choose to donate for that, that week. Um, and then if it's slightly damaged, we may list it on eBay if it's still in reasonable condition. Um, if there's nothing wrong with it, we'll literally send it right back to Amazon. Um, we'll also, if it's close to expiration or slightly damaged, we'll offer it to our employees at a discounted price so they can get some value out of it. Um, so those are some options. You really have so many options. You could also, if you start building relationships with uh, liquidators, you could you could sell them assorted pallets for the low. Now your return on your investment is going to be pennies on the dollar for that, but it's better than having it sit in your warehouse or in your storage unit collecting dust. Nobody wants to do that. Amazon display ads better than sponsored brand for a product with low margins. So you wanna play around with them. You know, some products display ads work better than sponsored brands. Um, other products, it's, it's vice versa. So you definitely wanna play around with it and you wanna experiment. I think that's really, that's really the best thing you could do is experiment with these listings. You know, I would be doing you a disservice if I told you to do one or the other or one over the other because they both provide us a lot of profit. Um, but depends on the listing, depends on, you know, the click-through rate, de depends on the cost per click, depends on how much we're actually spending on that product. So those are all things you want to keep in mind. What can you do when you receive bad voice of the customer for Pokemon and customer unboxed and return them and leave bad voice of the customer? So you got to listen we get a lot of voice of the customer requests. And if anybody's wondering um, how to get to your voice of the customer, you'd simply go to performance and it's the last selection from the bottom. It's above Seller University. It says voice of the customer, your NCX, um, which basically allows Amazon to populate all the negative reviews from products purchased from your company by an, a consumer. So what it does is, let's say, for example, this gentleman had a Pokemon product. You want to look at what the customers are talking about because what was their negative review? Maybe it was the wrong product. Maybe it was damaged on shipping. You know, maybe it was open. So you want to review those NCX mm -hmm. complaints and then navigate accordingly. So if you're getting a lot of um, complaints saying that the product's open, then possibly it was a mistake on your packaging. Maybe you didn't package it tight enough. Maybe you should have put it in a box. Maybe you should have bubble wrapped it. So it'll give you a good indication of what you should be doing the next time you sell that product. And the beautiful thing about NCX is you actually have the opportunity to reinstate the listing right there. So you just click like, I accept these. Um, you put a little description of why or how you're gonna fix them. And then you relist the product right there. So we usually make calculated decisions based on how much inventory we have left. If we're going to relist the product, you can even edit the listing. That's an option as well. So for you with your Pokemon cards, I would, kind of dive into those reviews and see what they're saying. Maybe it was something on your end and maybe they're not right. So yeah, they opened it, they had a complaint and they returned it to you, but it's like, why did they return it to you? If they left that NCX complaint, it's for a reason. So dive into that. When do you think is a good time to quit your nine to five and focus strictly on your business? So obviously you don't want to quit your nine to five unless you're, you have income coming in. Right, and a lot of people, they wanna supplement 100% of your income, but I'm gonna give you a different perspective here. And I'm gonna give you a gauge to go by. And I'm gonna say 80%, right? So let's say you're making $100,000 a year at your full-time job. And you say, I'm not going to quit my full-time job and go all in on Amazon until I'm making from Amazon $100,000 a year. 
but let me paint this picture for you. Let's say you go 80% of that. And instead you say, I'm not going to quit my full-time job until I'm making $80,000 from Amazon. Then I'll quit my full-time job. Now you may be asking yourself, well, how does that make sense? Why am I going to quit my $100,000 a year job to only be making $80,000 a year? Well, here's the thing, because the day you quit that full-time job, you're going to have an extra 40 hours to work on your Amazon business a week, 40 hours at minimum. That's not even including commuting time. So you're going to have that additional time to really focus on your business. So going from 80 and then growing your salary to 120, 140, whatever you need to survive will be much easier because you'll have that extra 40, 50 hours a week to be focusing on your business. So I would encourage you to, to, to shoot for the 80% mark if you're trying to quit your job, you know? All right, what else we got here? We got tons of questions. This is great. I love doing this. Um, hey, OG, how do you keep production staff on top of production goals? How many do you get them to prep in a typical eight hour shift? Uh, so a typical eight hour shift, we have 20 production employees downstairs. A typical eight hour shift, they're producing about 11,000 orders. Um, so I think it's, I was just doing this the other day. I think they're each doing about 68 orders a mi um, an hour. So, and we have five employees at each station. So times five. So they're doing about 300, each station is doing about 340 um, items an hour. Um, and then you said, how do you keep production staff on top of production goals? Money, right? Why does everybody wake up? Why, there's 60, 66 people in here right now. Why do you wake up in the morning and go to work? It's a valid question. Think about that for a minute. Why do you work into the late hours of the night if you're building your side business? Why did you become an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, there's underlying facts of why people do that because they really want to be of service to others, right? But at the end of the day, a lot of it has to do with freedom. And now money does not buy happiness, but what money can purchase is freedom and freedom brings happiness. So incentivize your production team, incentivize them. We incentivize ours and we notice production go up almost 30%. So when we said, hey, this is the, the quarterly goal. Every three months, we expect you to hit this. And for the first quarter, let's say, or your goal is 748,000 ASINs we want you to produce in the first three months of 2021, right? And then if they hit that number, that's the bare minimum. That's the bare minimum. Anything over that, they get a tiered bonus structure. So, you know, if you go 1% over that, you might get $100. If you go 2% over that, you get $200. If you get 3% over that, you get $300, 4%, $400. $4. And the sky is the limit. So as, as much inventory as they're producing, we don't care. We'll, we'll pay them up to, we'll pay them all $3,000 additional every quarter. Because the more they're producing, the more our business is able to make. So I would encourage you to... Uh, implement some sort of bonus incentive program for your company, 100%. What's the best way to find distributors? So right here, there's a video, watch it, check it out. It will show you how one of the eight methods that we teach our members on how to find distributors. Uh, man, do you have a course about how to deal with wholesalers and get a list of wholesalers? Yes, we actually do have a course. I mean, if you wanna DM me right here on Instagram, um, I think we have two, maybe three spots left open. Um, so yeah, if if you want to find out more about that, just send me a DM on Instagram and I'd be happy to uh, provide some additional information here. What's the best state to start the Amazon business in terms of tax purposes and location purposes? The best state is the one that you're in because it will be the most convenient. But there's some tax incentives in Nevada. There's also some tax incentives in Delaware. But at the end of the day, it's like convenience, right? Your first year, you shouldn't be, you're, you're, the sale, the tax incentives compared to the sales you're going to do in that first year aren't even worth it. That's something you could figure out in year two. Start your business literally today, right now, right? While you're watching this, you should be setting up your Seller Central account. You should be creating an Amazon account. You should be sourcing products to sell on Amazon if you already have an Amazon business. You should be taking action. This is the thing, 
Most successful people, they're not the smartest people in the world. I'm not the smartest person in the room. And if I am the smartest person in the room, that means I'm in the wrong room. Most successful people, what, what differentiates them from others is the willing to put in the work, the willingness to succeed, the determination to persevere. That is what separates them from everybody else. They're not the most intelligent people. They're not the brightest light bulb but they know how to take action. So take action, my friend. Yeah, I don't get into the used game. So someone just said, um, speaking of returns, we could list it as used on Amazon. Me personally, I'm not in the used business. I'm in the brand new condition business. The used business is just, it's just too much. It's too much. It's just like customer complaints and oh, you said it was used, but it's damaged used or it's very used or it's not used like new and it's just, it's just too much for me. So I give credit to any booksellers out there conditioning books because that's just not something I'm up for. It's a lot of work to do that. It's a lot of work. Here's the thing, right? If I get, let's say we get a product back. Let's say this, this is, I was actually eating this on my pizza today. But let's say I get this habanero uh, or green pepper sauce, this Tabasco back, right? And I get, it's a single unit and I get five of them. And I look it up on Amazon and we're making you know, a dollar fifty, two dollars every time we sell one. I, I honestly, I would probably just donate it because the amount of time it's going to take for me to relist it, FBM, if it was slightly damaged, relist it, FBM. The order comes in. Now I have to have someone on my team pick up this product, pick it from its location, bring it to the packaging station, package it, print the shipping label, ship it out. I honestly, I'd rather just donate it, especially because it's a food product. And when you donate food, at least in the state of New Jersey, you get 1.5 times the item cost. So I would, I would rather just donate it. So it's all about time management here. Um, this guy's been book selling for over two years now. Want to break in the wholesale. Where do we start? You start right here. You start right here. Follow our journey, my friend. DM me as well, because I got something special for you. But you just get started. Listen, at the end of the day, your your book business isn't gonna to turn into a wholesale business in four or five months. It's gonna take time, but set goals for yourself. I say this all the time. Let's say in three months, you have a 15% wholesale business and a 85% book business. That's progress. Then it becomes 30, 70. That's more progress. It's all about progress and not perfection. This guy asks, who are your favorite distributors? <laughs> Yeah, that's not happening, my friend. That's funny, though. That's a, that guy's a jokester. When is the time to take the leap for a warehouse, you think? When you're running out of space in your current location. So, uh, you know, when we moved from a basement to our first warehouse, which I think was 1,200 square feet, it was really just out of necessity because we were sick of running packages up the stairs. We were running out of space. It just, we knew we couldn't grow out of that basement. And then when we moved to that 1,200 square foot warehouse, we were there for about nine, maybe 10 months. And we just maxed out the space. There was no more room. You couldn't move anything. The amount of time it took for us to move this pallet to get to this pallet and move this pallet to get to that pallet and that product to get to that product. It was just so time consuming. It was like we had to make some changes. So we moved to a bigger space and then that was 2,500 square feet. And then we just ran out of room. We were literally, we had, that's when we got our first high low in that second warehouse, which was 2,500 square feet. And there came a time where we couldn't even turn it around in the warehouse because we had so many products everywhere. So like light bulb, we need a new warehouse, knock down a wall. Now we have 5,000 square feet, run out of space there, knock down a wall. Now we have 15,000 square feet. That place isn't good enough anymore. It's not big enough, need more space, move to a new warehouse. So it's like you need to expand your business when you see that expanding it will allow you to grow bigger. And hopefully you realize before we realized that we were running out of space because we should have got a lot of these places that we moved into, we should have got three or four months prior to us even moving to them. You know, but this is the learning curve. This is why we did this so you don't have to, right? We made a lot of those mistakes in the beginning so you don't have to make those mistakes because we've made every mistake in the book. We've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in mistakes in the past seven years. You know, between purchasing incorrect inventory, Amazon products getting restricted, um, you know, moving into a smaller warehouse than we should have. So many mistakes, hundreds of thousands of dollars in mistakes. We made them so you don't have to but you only won't make them as well if you pay attention. If you don't wanna pay attention, then you're gonna make them too. And that's okay. 
It's part of the grind. Some people need to learn the hard way. Some people like to learn the easy way. And the easy way is finding someone who's been doing what you are trying to do and taking their guidance because it eliminates all those trials and tribulations. It makes your life much easier, my friends. What is the minimum quantity of products to have in our inventory? Uh, so this is actually a great question. I'm glad you brought this up. So I'm going to throw something out here. This is almost game changing stuff. This is like, this is high level stuff. So I hope you got your pens out, but here's a concept. This is mind blowing concept that I'm talking about right now. And it's so basic, but a lot of people don't think about it. They just don't, but it makes absolute sense, right? So let's say on average daily, you have 5,000 units in stock, right? And those 5,000 units in stock are generating, let's say $20,000 in monthly sales. So every day on average, between what you're sending in and what's selling, your average in stock quantity is 5,000 units and your average monthly sales are $20,000. Now, let's say you bump that average in stock quantity from 5,000 units to 10,000 units. What do you think is going to happen to your business? It's going to 2X. You're going to go from $20,000 in monthly sales to $40,000 in monthly sales. It's just, it just makes sense, right? You double your inventory levels. As long as your inventory is selling and it is moving, then you will double your sales. So you have to be staying on top of your pricer, making sure this inventory is selling. And as long as you do that, you will double your business. So to answer your question, how much inventory you should have, in total, you should be trying to at least increase your inventory 20 to 30% every week or so, every two weeks, until you're hitting your maximum amount that you could produce at the level you are. And then when you hit that maximum amount that you could produce at the level that you are, you start hiring more employees and scaling it from there. It's just basic economics, you know, supply and demand. You can only produce as much as the people that you have that can produce for you. So sometimes you need to bring on additional team members. What else we got here? I love this. I could do this forever, but I'm not gonna do it forever tonight because I'm, I'm going to the gym after this. I got my gym clothes here. Been trying to get to the gym for a couple of days, late nights on Clubhouse, late nights at the office, late, late night consulting. It's just boom, boom, boom. Before you know it, I haven't been to the gym since Sunday. It's Thursday. So I'm going to the gym after this. What's your strategy for never running out of stock of a product? That's a good question. And there's really two things I wanna say about that. The first is sometimes we like to run out of stock of a product. And now let me explain why we like to run out of stock for a product. It kind of resets the listing, right? It allows the other sellers to get in their action. Um, sometimes they might drop the price a little, sometimes they might go higher, right? But it makes the other sellers on the listing happy or very sad, either one is good for us. Um, but sometimes we like to go out of stock on a listing, but in order to stay in stock on a listing, you have to understand your lead times from your wholesalers and distributors and the time it takes you to produce and ship these products to Amazon. Let's say you have three weeks of inventory left in Amazon of a product, right? Based on its current sales, you've been selling it for three previous weeks. Now you have three weeks left of inventory of a SKU that you're selling on Amazon. And you know that there's a one week lead time from the distributor to you, so you, you place the order, now your three weeks becomes two weeks. And then you know it takes another week to 10 days for you to produce that product and get it into Amazon. Now your three weeks becomes one week or a half a week. So you're gonna get it in stock just in time to replenish the inventory. So you definitely wanna know your lead times when we're replenishing inventory. It's, it's, it's a crucial aspect to scaling. All right, we got some Rio de Janeiro in the house. Got some Portugal. We worldwide, baby. Do you have tips on how to get a warehouse and what percentage of your revenue can warehouse take yearly? Um, so warehousing, loopnet.com, great place for a warehouse. And if you're low on funds, you could look to sublease a warehouse space. So you find someone with a warehouse and let's say they have 20,000 square feet and in the corner, they got 3,000 square feet that they're not using and they wanna sublet it. Um, and you could sublease that warehouse space and something you're gonna do if you do consider doing that is you wanna communicate with the owner of the building and make sure you have access to the bay doors and that you have access 24 seven, because I know me, sometimes I like to work till two, three in the morning. You want that to be an option if you're, if you're subleasing or subletting.
rather. So yeah, and as far as revenue can a warehouse take yearly, it, it's, I can't give you a number on that. I could, because different states are different prices. We're, we're in tri-state areas, so you know we're paying $12, $13 a square foot, sometimes $15 a square foot. Um, but if you're in you know North Dakota, you could be paying $5 a square foot. So I, I can't give a statistic on that. Have you ever had an account get banned? Uh, we've had some account suspensions, yes. And we took care of them accordingly to get them reinstated. Some took 24 hours, other took 72 hours. And I didn't sleep much that week. Do you recommend outsourcing VAs from Philippines? If yes, do they call suppliers to build the relationships? V, man. V, first of all, glad you got, I got to see you on Clubhouse in a couple of rooms, man. Happy to invite you in and have you join in on the fun. Um, but no, uh, we, do we use VAs? Yes. Do we have them call our suppliers? No. Um, unless they speak very clear English and they know exactly how you operate your business, because this is what I found when you outsource your supplier contact connection. They don't know every aspect of your business. That supplier might ask that one question and that one question that VA might not have the answer to. So I personally encourage, even to this day, Sebastian and I build 99% of the relationships that we build with wholesalers and distributors because I can rattle off everything about our business. I can, I just know, I know it front to back. So does Sebastian. So we can answer all those questions. So if a supplier asks, you know, how do we deal with customer complaints? How do we deal with customer returns? What happens if we receive damaged inventory? You know, what are we willing to spend monthly? What are we willing to order yearly? Um, you know, what can we expect as far as our credit options? Do we want net 30? Do we want net 60? Um, are we going to be using credit card or ACH? Like all of these questions that the supplier might be asking on the fly, if you don't have answers to those, you could possibly delay the account because the supplier or the wholesaler is going to be like, guy doesn't even know what he's talking about. I'm asking these questions and he said he's got to take write notes and call me back. That's crazy. And I just did this and I realized I watched a video today where they were asking little kids, like I guess like 12 years and younger, maybe even older and younger. But, um, and it was like, how do you, how do you signal like a phone, like with your hand? And like, you know, I was born in late eighties. So like, this is a phone to me, right? When you got the cord hanging from the kitchen the wall and you got to wrap it around and someone calls while someone's on the internet and it makes that noise, like, you know, like that, that's, that's a phone to me. But like all these kids did this because they got, they got their phones. I don't know where my phone is, but they got their phones, you know? Are you in the replan business? Yes. You talked about having a warehouse. Uh, we do do FBA. This is a common misconception. It's common, common misconception, I see. A lot of people see our giant warehouse and they say, why don't you do Amazon FBA? And it's like, we do do Amazon FBA. We get all the products shipped here. We package them here. We don't use um, any third-party prep facilities. And we don't use Amazon prep services because we can actually produce the products for cheaper than any of those service can here. Cheaper and faster. So we get all of the products shipped to us and then we ship them to Amazon FBA facilities. Now, once in a while, we do ship direct to Amazon if it's like a one sticker, uh, you know, one item product and it's just 30 cents Amazon label fee. Once in a while, we do do that. But for the most part, 97% of our inventory is shipped directly to our warehouse for quality control and because it's less expensive for us to do that. So we do do FBA. If a supplier doesn't ship FBA, but is willing to ship to you, what's the best way to calculate shipping into gross profit? Um, so you would take, you would, uh, you can use basically any broker's website. Um, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, Unishippers is one. I was just using another one today, I can't think of it, but you use a broker's website or even something like Estes or Saya. You could use one of their websites, create an account and get instant freight quotes, right? Or if the distributor gives you what the price of the shipping is going to be, which they usually will, what you do is, let's say it's $1,000, right? And on that order is 2,000 ASINs. Now this is an important fact, not units, 2,000 ASINs. Because if you're selling, that we're trying to get the cost per sale for shipping. This is super important. You can't do units because some of these you might be selling 12 packs and then you're gonna have to multiply that unit 
cost per shipping times 12 for that specific ASIN. And that can really drive up the cost of one specific product, especially if you have a 24 pack and it's five cents, you know, per unit to ship it. Now you're adding a dollar 20 to that item cost. So you want to take your total shipping cost, let's say for example, thousand dollars and you're ordering 2000 ASINs or let's say 4,000 ASINs on that product. So you would do 1,000 divided by 4,000 and your cost per ASIN that you would need to add into your calculations to get gross profits would be 25 cents. Now, something we do is we just calculate our shipping as an expense and we don't put it into the cost of the product. So we're not figuring out that calculation only because about 95% of our distributors um, don't charge us shipping. So it's such a small amount that we just expense it at the end of the year um, as a shipping expense and add it to our taxes like that. You know, so we're calculating for it after the fact and we're not adding it as an item cost or cost of good addition. If that makes sense. In your opinion, what is the most difficult for beginners? Really, if you're a beginner, you're gonna overthink a lot of things. You're probably gonna fall into an analysis paralysis stage where you're just analyzing and you're spending four weeks watching YouTube videos. Um, and then you spend another one week scrolling on people's Instagrams, dreaming about how big you're gonna grow your business. And then you're gonna spend probably another two weeks joining every private Facebook group and so now you're at four, one, two, now you're at seven weeks, not getting a lot accomplished. So I would say just take action. That's one of the biggest uh, difficulties I, I see new sellers make is not taking action, just take action. You know, if you find somebody that you trust can guide you through this process, link up with them. Save a ton of time. Time is our most valuable asset as humans. So it'll save you a ton of time. Yeah, it might cost you a little money. Time is money. And if you could save time, you're making money. Um, but yeah, some of the, the, the biggest struggles, finding distributors, researching products, that's a huge one. A lot of sellers, you know, first six to nine months, six to 12 months, they're buying inventory that they're not even making money on, that ends up not selling, they're frustrated, they're sending me messages. I get that all the time. Stay, stay persistent. Make sure you master your craft. That would be my words of advice. Any recommendations on which distributors to start with a 10K budget? You know, here's the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this debate forever, right, right now. <laughs> because like, listen, I could give you, I got a list of 150 distributors. I could give them to you. I can give them to all of you. But here's the thing. Then they're not gonna be good distributors. They're not. Because I just gave them to 150 people or in this room right now, we got 70 people. They're no longer good distributors. So instead of giving you a fish for you so you can eat for a day, I'd rather teach you how to fish so you can eat for your life, right? So you can go fish whenever you want, find your distributors whenever you want. That is the important factor here. So I will not be giving anybody any distributors, but I got some videos on YouTube and in our training program, we show you every method that we use to find distributors and you could replicate them in your business. Um, prep centers or a warehouse and employees. So here's the thing. They both have their pros and cons. I personally prefer the warehouse and employee route. Much more control over your products. Um, if you're going to use prep centers, then you have to calculate those costs, those additional costs for prep services into your profit calculations. Um, so there's that. But it really depends on where you are, right? If you live in an apartment in Tampa, Florida, on the third story of an apartment complex, then, then maybe you want to go with prep centers. You know, but if you live in a, in a spacious home with a two-car garage or a pretty fluffy basement, then, then maybe you want to produce the products yourself because it, you have the space to do so. So I think it's all situational. It depends on where you are in your journey. I appreciate each and every one of you spending this time with me here. You know, we had a very, very good turnout tonight. Got some amazing questions. Talked about warehousing and gross profit versus net profit and all these, these wonderful topics that, that keep me on my A game and will help you grow your business. So I'm grateful to have you here. I can't wait till COVID clears up. Like I said in the beginning, I can start flying around the world again, meeting all you in person. 
hosting free seller meetups, you know, grabbing some drinks and some food, um, exploring business opportunities and just connecting because I'm a, I'm a people person and, and I thrive off relationships. Uh, make sure if you're not subscribed, you subscribe to this channel. We love having you here. These are the Sunday sessions. So these will be every week for a minimum of the next 52 weeks. I'll be hosting a live video talking about business growth and different techniques and ways to grow your business. I'm gonna end with this. Wherever you are on your journey, know that there is more to come. And do not quit before the miracle happens because the miracle is right around the corner. Do not be the person who gives up before that miracle is struck. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you all for joining me. I love this. Hope you do something productive with your evening. Another Sunday sessions. Stay grateful and stay with us.